Welcome to the Cafe Scientific 10.0. We're discussing on this topic of the challenges in the green transition and developing a sustainable economy. And for this session, we have invited uh, Mr. Daniel Taras, who is the head of uh, sustainable economic transformation and finance with the GIZ. I'll just give a brief introduction about Mr. Daniel. Daniel is the head of sustainable economic transformation and finance at the GIZ, Germany's international cooperation agency. In this function, he and his team of roughly 60 project managers and policy advisors support the German federal ministries, the EU, international organizations, and developing and emerging countries in designing and implementing sustainable economic development strategies. The topics covered include sustainable finance, climate economy, green economy, blue economy, just transition, financial systems development, inclusive insurance, risk finance, entrepreneurial ecosystems, the SME development, startup support, and climate innovations. Previously, previous roles included, previous roles of Daniel included uh, head of global sector programs with the sustainable economic development and climate economy at the GIZ, directing a program on sustainable infrastructure and climate change at the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C., and setting up and heading the GIZ's Emerging Market Sustainability Dialogues, the ESMD, which addresses the global sustainability challenges. At GIZ, he, he was also the head of sections in the Global Partnerships and Emerging Economies Unit in Berlin, Corporate Social Responsibility and Economic Policy Advisor in China and Laos, respectively. And before that, he was working as, with a, as a strategic management consultant, investment banker, and financial sector economist in London. Daniel holds a BSc in economics with the London School of Economics and uh, MSc in uh, development finance and MPhil focusing on Chinese economy and an executive master's on, exec on change leadership at the HEC Paris side business school, Oxford University. Is also an alumnus of the German Development Institute and the, of the Peking University in China. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you very much. So we, have, we, we intended to discuss quite a lot on the uh, latest emerging topics in the industry because um, we wanted to discuss on circular economy, the blue economy, the green economy. The green transition is something which there's a lot of challenges which are coming inside. Uh, the society, the, the industries want the change, but again comes a financial challenge. But before we get into this, I would love to hear from you about the GIZ, the role of GIZ, and how do you find the role of GIZ? Well, thank you. So GIZ is uh, a federally owned uh, company. Um, it is not for profit. It makes it quite special. It's really there to support sustainable development globally on behalf of our clients, which are ministries, as you mentioned already, the EU, the World Bank, and so on, and also private companies, in fact. Um, GIZ is uh, a pretty large organization, um, 24,000 uh, staff globally. Um, we are working in about 130 countries, mainly emerging and developing countries, and um, we have a consulting turnover of about uh, three to three and a half uh, billion euros per year, um, which is not financial assistance development aid as such, where you transfer money, but it's actually invested into uh, capacity development, training, and the like. So helping and working together with our partner countries um, in uh, reforming um, systems globally. Wonderful. And um, being a very large organization with 24,000 employees that you mentioned, uh, how does this whole management of the GIZ happen? Is it from the ministries over here? And like, since it's an international development agency, uh, how about the mm -hmm. global coordinations and the cooperations and everything? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, like uh, every consultancy, uh, very similar to in the private sector, we are working on the basis of commissions. So we need to apply for um, project funding, so to speak. 
and that will then come from different ministries. And depending on the political priorities of those ministries, um, that will then determine what we are going to do. But at the same time, of course, like every good uh, consultancy, we would come up with our own ideas and propose projects and um, see what which we can do and the range is very broad I mean we're talking about the green transition here but we're talking about anything from post-war reconstruction in Afghanistan all the way to um, support to climate change negotiations of maybe some countries that would not otherwise be able to do so because of a lack of capacity um, to um, maybe emergency aid in certain uh, countries that are currently uh, affected by the war so it's a very broad range of things but our main uh, client, so to speak, is the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, which is commonly associated with what you would commonly call development aid. Uh, and the, the chunk of the, the projects come from that ministry. And here, of course, we have a new government right now. And with that come new ministers. And with that come new priorities. Um, and that is the process we're in right now. So we see, um, as with every new government, we see a shift of uh, priorities, of uh, labels, and of course we have the political situation that's coming in as well at the moment, and that really influences uh, what, what we're doing in our current work. Having said that, in essence, what we work on, which is sustainable economic development, we've been doing that for 20, 30, 40 years, and before sustainability as a term uh, you know, was all over the place. I mean, five years ago, you wouldn't see it on any advertisement, right? But now you, it's everywhere. If you don't put it on your product, people won't buy it possibly, or people will buy it because it's there, let's put it this way. And we've been working on this um, pretty much all this while. And in this sense, uh, the core of what we do hasn't really changed, I would say, because we've been always working on capacitating partners to be able to eventually do it themselves. And in the process, we do it with our partners. So we're not just coming in and saying, well, five months we're here and uh, job done, uh, here's, here's your study and off we go. Uh, next time we come again and we do it again. I mean, that, that would be maybe something that somebody in the profit sector would do, but we are, we are not for profit, so we have a mission to improve things. And this is also what our, um, well, the German government or, or other, other governments want as well. So you mean to say that this is a non-profit organization? It's a mm -hmm. non-profit organization, mm -hmm. but at the same time for sustaining the whole business model, there is a commission-based, uh, project-based yes, commission. It's incorporated is... uh, in, as a GmbH, mm -hmm. so, um, but not for profit, so which means the, any profits uh, that are made, and there are profits um, that we need for sort of risk adjustments internally, but any profits that we made in the end, they need to be reinvested into the company for the purposes of the, the vision of the, the corporation, which is sustainable economic development. It means if there's money left at the end of the day, then this money needs to be invested into projects that we then design ourselves as opposed to somebody else commissioning it for us. So that's the setup. So they are, they are shareholders, yes, and that's the German government but any kind of dividends and, and profits, if you will, they will have to be reinvested into the company. That's nice. Now mm -hmm. comes across, like uh, the industry is speaking about the whole, uh, whole lot of green transition. But do you see any challenges in this green transition? Because uh, the war is going on, the pandemic was there. Mm -hmm. Almost all the countries are now going through a very uh, bad phase. Mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka is going through an economic crisis. Uh, there are economic crises in many uh, countries in Africa, including Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, uh, the, in the Asian region, many countries, Pakistan was also going through an economic crisis. Now, with mm -hmm. these challenges coming inside, they would need more of an aid. And uh, mm -hmm. the second thing is, at this point of time, when the aid is there, uh, is there a possibility for the industries to upgrade themselves? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very good question. I mean, I think uh, when we had uh, first the corona pan pandemic came in, there were all these nice pictures of these different waves of uh, tsunamis uh, coming our way. Uh, the, the first big one before that, obviously, being the, the, the climate change issue, which was the, the thing that really dominated the international agenda these days. And then all of a sudden came COVID and corona, and all the attention got diverted to a certain extent. And in this context, we had this whole discussion of the green recovery as in, well, we have an economic crisis now, why are we not using that opportunity? And uh, since we need to uh, revamp things anyhow, let's build back better. Let's do it in a better way. Let's straight away go on a different transition path economically than from what we've done before. 
now we have another crisis and before that we had the financial crisis so there there have been crises all every four or five years to a certain extent and of course they've been affecting different countries differently and now we have uh, well the Ukraine and everything that goes with it and of course the Ukraine doesn't only affect the Ukraine itself which is obviously the, the worst of all things but then we around it we have countries that are affected economically and then we have this whole economic uh, indirect effects and shocks uh, in terms of you mentioned it uh, resource uh, price increases, uh, uh, no availability of food, and so on, and it's it's a it's a big big issue. And yes, um, talking about our main commissioning party in the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, yes, of course they are now focusing on that crisis, and that also means if you have your limited uh, budget available for certain things, that also means you are will be diverting funds from the more medium to long term idea of that green transition and we call it here in, in Germany more the socio-ecological transition or the sustainable economic transition if you will to focus a little more even on the social aspects as well so it's not just green it's also about a social transformation so to speak so and that medium to long-term goal is now kind of overshadowed by what we have to deal with in the in the short term in the immediate term and that's what we're seeing there is a reallocation of attention and also funding towards that and which is just natural. I mean, if you don't have to have to eat, the first thing you do is you try and find your bread somewhere. You're not going to look at uh, how can I grow my grain, right? I mean, that's that's a bit similar situation we are facing here. But having said that, we are trying to make sure that the attention doesn't get diverted here, and that at the same time, just like in the uh, the beginnings of the Corona crisis, that we are combining this sort of emergency approach on the one hand, if you will with one that is more uh, medium to long term. So, and that's the challenge to balance the two and ensure that one doesn't get, get forgotten here. I think uh, that was very interesting when you said this because this is something which also I need to put it across to the students is also that uh, uh, the word sustainability has become very, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been very overused and that's mm. something which has been the talk and also like as you mentioned down uh, that uh, this challenge which comes inside will be like a springboard for mm -hmm. once again for the new industries to mm -hmm. come inside, which you're mentioning. But then like uh, with this new transition that's coming inside, that's absolutely going to be an, a transactional cost, which is going to be heavy, which is mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the cost of investing, which is going to be there. Some countries can invest this, mm -hmm. some countries cannot invest this. Mm -hmm. So they once again leads to a gap mm -hmm. where um, this gap is bound to be detrimental because in the long run, Mm -hmm. uh, those countries which have developed, which have invested, become more developed. Mm -hmm. and those countries which could not in this period mm -hmm. of time will be more under, and that gap, the underdeveloped, and thereby the gap will be continuing. How do you see this on your views again regarding the same thing? I mean, this is obviously a correct, a very correct observation. And uh, what we have to see also is, uh, well, you, you can call it costs. Uh, you should really call it investment, right? If you believe that what you're doing here is really makes sense, you're not just spending the money and it's gone, but you're investing it and it will re yield a return. And everybody who's done business studies uh, will know at some point there will be, uh, you know, your, your payback uh, has been reached and you have a certain return on things and obviously it will not come within the first two months or something like that. So this is taking the medium to long term view once again. Mm. But you're also perfectly right, even, you know, the, the poor person on the street who doesn't have access to finance, and this is the equivalent to a country that doesn't have access to finance, or has only access to finance which is very expensive or puts it at risk because it can only borrow at uh, dollars for instance right and and then you have the issue where the US raises the interest rates and all of a sudden your, today your rates been, go off exactly today so, it's going to be the so there's a lot of things happening there and uh, that's where I think and of course a country like Germany I mean has much more fiscal space uh, in fact people got used to the idea now here that it's okay to make a bit of debt and uh, finance things and this seems to be now a valid cause which is nicely combined with what's happening in Ukraine you need to shift things anyway so in traditional change management theory you would say great I've got my I've got my burning platform here, the cause for change. All of a sudden there's an urgency in this change process and people understand it and people need to do it. Two years ago, in, in this sense it was, uh, I mean it's the right and wrong th thing to say, but it's been a blessing for the transformation to have that energy crisis now, if you will, because all of a sudden people need to switch and need to act fast. Um, for other countries, I mean, and especially developing and emerging countries, it's a very different picture. Uh, maybe no access to finance and again because there is not so much um, 
fiscal space in the, in the first place, so not, not much government budget. And because of that, um, there's again the more immediate issues, socioeconomic issues more than uh, you know, having enough to eat, having a job, uh, uh, being able to set up a small company and so on. So this, this is not a given. And the way we are looking at this also at GIZ is, is how do you now combine this and bring people together? And I think a nice example, even though it's maybe a little overused, is, is the whole question of uh, green hydrogen. So, I mean, everybody, I think, has probably heard about hydrogen here and the importance also for that transformation. It's not the only thing that shouldn't be forgotten, but it's an important component on it, of it. And Germany has a green hydrogen strategy. And the whole idea is obviously you, you produce the stuff where it's cheapest to produce. And that's not uh, in Germany where the weather is sometimes rather bad. But uh, you go to a country such as Morocco or maybe Chile or uh, wherever. I mean, where, where, can, where, where sun is plentiful and the cost of electricity production is low. And that has, uh, in a way, a lot of opportunities also for these countries uh, because they are now becoming a new raw input producer, so to speak. The challenges before is just as with oil and uh, gold or metals or anything like that, not to create the same sort of dependency structures that existed already you know, since the 60s, 70s, as in the rich industrialized countries, they suck in all the raw materials and there's no local industry development or anything like that. And that's the idea here on green hydrogen now, that ideally around this, where you source the, source the electricity and where you essentially get this ready for export to, mm. to Europe, to the US, wherever, that you're building an ecosystem around it and entrepreneurship, everything. So it's not just something that's standing in the middle of, uh, you know, the desert, so to speak, with lots of solar panels around it, and that's it. But did you have this whole um, impetus for, for the economy locally? And, and to do that and to help countries with that, that's something that, that is kind of the core of our business. And on, on that, it's not only about technology, it's also about framework conditions. I mean, how do you improve the business climate for that, for instance, right? How do you improve institutions? How do you reduce um, corruption, maybe, right, in some cases, and so on. So that, that is part of the package, in, in a way. Um, it's education, too. I mean, how do you ensure that there are, there's enough skills for, well, servicing solar panels? You need, you need qualified people, the so-called green jobs. Where do they come from? People need to be qualified for that. They can't just turn up and you know, and here we go and, and <laughs> you fix it. I mean, so there's a lot of things happening around it and there's a lot of scope really to work together. And it's gonna be the be for the benefit of everyone really, if, it, if it's done well. And being done well also means that it's not a one-sided thing, uh, cheap, uh, cheap energy for, for the rich countries and, uh, and nothing much left for the poor. So that's not the idea of it at least. In fact, when the war began, uh, mm. war, uh, Russia, attacked um, uh, Ukraine and uh, immediately like there was a lot of uh, 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 there was a shock and then again like there was a lot of uh, academic discussions which were going on I was just discussing with my provost also uh, stating that how do you see this consequences because uh, the war has happened and again mm -hmm. if you notice the the the, uh, the kind of uh, sanctions and the threat was on the energy mm -hmm. and thereby he was mentioning me stating that there was one thing where uh, Europe has uh, strongly forged for green transition and green energy and thereby uh, Europe has closed down majority of the coal plants mm -hmm. and thereby uh, but then and has completely been dependent on Russia and now that's really affected uh, the industries a lot. Do you also see that industries are affected because of this to total dependence on green transition by closing down all the existing energy sources? Well, I think it's really a question of diversification at the right time, right? I think it's also another new word that's popped up everywhere now. It's about resilience. And if you want to be resilient, you need to also diversify in every mm. sense, right? Mm. Resilience was an issue already during uh, the corona crisis when it hit. Um, I read some, some articles about uh, companies here in Germany um, where uh, an owner admitted, well, quite frankly, um, what I've done is because the spot prices for energy were so low, I didn't bother going into forward contracts mm. and securing this at a lower mm. price. Mm. But instead, um, I hope that this is gonna go on forever. So in a way, it's also my fault that I didn't uh, look into this. So this is the company perspective, right? And this is obviously one example, and I found it very, 
very nice to, to have such an honest opinion as well, which shows, well, we need to think about resilience. We need to have a bit of redundancy in what we do. You know, maybe we've been too efficient all this while. You know, everything is just in time. Everything arrives on time. And if there's a disruption, then you're in real trouble. That's what we are probably seeing right now at all levels because everything has been optimized so much that if things go wrong at some point, then it will go really wrong. That's, that's the thing. Um, and in this sense, it is, it is good to have a, a diversification and, and backup plan. I mean, I'm not a, on a position to, to comment politically on mm. whether analytically, uh, uh, more one, one thing or the, the other thing makes analysis. sense, but yes. I mean, in general, it is always wise to to diversify, of course. And this diversification uh, was not there and thereby, if you, do you see that like it's it's really, it's affected to a percentage or like it's still, uh, it's able to be handled? How do you see this? A well, I'm not, an energy, I'm not an energy expert, okay. so I haven't done the calculations on that and so on. And I okay. think there's a lot of debate going on also in Germany, even among, uh, uh, you know, uh, specialist economists who, who are arguing, well, you know, it, it can be handled, it cannot be handled, and so on. But before I add but an But it is also opinion, an advantage for the green transition to happen, because this will force the green transition to happen much faster. And I think uh, even the government has mentioned that we need more electric vehicles to come inside, so that's one which has also happened um, to, to handle this. Hmm. Sure. Uh, now, uh, which are the pro if if uh, the, since uh, we have uh, uh, students from very diverse uh, backgrounds, we would also like to know which are the projects that uh, you recollect or like you could share, which the GIZ has done in different countries. Mm -hmm. It would be much more informative indeed. So. Sure. I mean, I think I can highlight one that we are just about to set up. So no results yet, but I think it's it's very interesting, especially for business business students and working on innovation. Um, we call it the uh, Climate Innovation Hubs. So what we're doing is we are working together with venture capital firms in uh, Latin America and West Africa. And uh, we're collaborating with uh, innovation hubs there, existing ones, who are already funding um, companies, accelerators, right? Typical accelerators and so on. And what we are trying to do is we're trying to make this more sustainable and more focused on climate tech and climate innovation because what they've done so far is, is just to look at any kind of business opportunity that comes along. And the idea behind this is, of course, if we build that capacity in those countries, then that can also be a starting point to really build the local ecosystem. If we have some you know, very strong startups working on, on climate innovation, climate tech, and so on. And we're trying to address a sort of uh, early stage seed, pre-seed stage where it's very difficult for, uh, for companies really to get anything. So we are talking ticket sizes, $100,000 plus minus, which is then going to be essentially funded um, as a repayable grant. That's the term. Strictly speaking, it's a first loss guarantee. So meaning, you know, you get the money. If things go wrong, then you don't have to pay it back. If things go well, then you pay it back at some point, and then the money goes back into the fund and can be uh, re-channeled. Re, re um, and that's, I think, it's going to be a very exciting project. Um, it's also going to include uh, uh, women and women's economic empowerment because we're also trying to ensure that uh, more women entrepreneurs are coming up there. And in doing that, we are we are trying to help those guys on the ground to to really see how they can screen specifically for climate impact as well. So because to really demonstrate to investors at the larger scale who are very interested in this, obviously, that you're working on, on uh, climate and that really has an impact, you also need to work on your, your, your metrics and your criteria, right? I mean, that you can really transparently um, demonstrate that you actually have an impact. So that's what we're working with them together. That's the plan. So we just we started last month and we're going to do this together with the uh, Green Climate Fund, which is, a, is another big international organization that's dedicated to climate change. And I think it's a very exciting project because it shows that, you know, we're not just a public sector actor who's doing all kind of bureaucracy, possibly what some people think when they talk, think about aid, uh, but that it's really a, a, a great uh, collaboration and to come in where the private sector will not normally do it on its own, so to speak. 
So you mentioned about Latin America and West Africa that you mentioned downstating mm. the, the, the regions where almost it's begun down and you mentioned that the innovation hubs have, st uh, start, mm -hmm. have started being, mm -hmm. the investments for the innovation hubs have mm -hmm. begun and especially focusing on climate tech is one of the industries mm -hmm. that you intend to start up. Could, because like uh, the class, uh, uh, we have students over here also from the regions and apart mm -hmm. from that, uh, we have the participating students who are also virtually there from the regions. Mm -hmm. And I think they could also have questions if they have. But uh, prior to that, like, can we also know which are those countries if, if which, where and which projects uh, mm -hmm. in specific as well, so that like, they could also understand yeah, sure. much on this? I mean, uh, country-wise, uh, it will be based in Mexico. Mexico. Uh, Tech de Monterrey is, uh, if somebody is here from Mexico, it's uh, oh, the, yeah. the, the, the MIT, the MIT of uh, Mexico, if you will. Yeah. So it's the, the top, top school there, yes. and they have an innovation hub there. And uh, West Africa right now, uh, we are considering Abidjan, uh, is Cote d'Ivoire, and there is, a, is also an innovation hub there that we are working with, so Excellent. there's some and collaboration think, uh, already. And, but the idea is obviously to make this regional, so um, this is the starting point, and, and with, with all our projects, the idea is now to scale up. So you start somewhere, you experiment, you see if it works or not. If it works, you might get more funding, and then you can you can do that also and replicate it in other settings. So it focuses on creating a innovation hub in those countries and supporting the entrepreneurs for seeding. For the, uh, that's for the that's right. That though is. we are actually collaborating with existing innovation hubs over there, but we are we're gonna you know inject essentially the the climate tech part and the women's economic empowerment part into it, and uh, in this sense to make them sustainable innovation hubs, if you will. And how do you find the response? Um, well, I mean, the fact that we, we've been in uh, uh, talks already and pretty much have commitment from, from big uh, venture capital funds from the US even on this and from France in, for Western Africa um, is, I think, a very good sign that they believe in that approach. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there is demand on the ground. But again, we're just starting. So we see how it goes. I mean, again, I mean, this is a startup business. So uh, as we all know, I mean, many of them fail. So um, and uh, we are, it's also a new new business for us in a way, because w traditionally we tend to work more on SME uh, funding and so on. And, you know, you have then 5,000, 10,000 of them there in place already, or you, you support small entrepreneurs who will not necessarily want to grow and so on. Some of them may be, some not. Startup is very diff startup business is very different. I mean, you, I don't know how many do fail. I mean, 98%, 95%, I don't know. So it's also for us to say, well, we're going to invest all this money now, or rather our commissioning parties are going to put money into this. And there is a risk because that none of it risk. will work out after three years. And that is also something that we are quite honestly not necessarily used to in the way we operate because we always have indicators by which our success is measured and on which we have to report. And you know, if, if all of a sudden, well, we pick 10 startups and, and they're not doing well, which is always a possibility, then, well, here you go. Then you have a, a bit of a problem maybe. But uh, I think it's exciting. I think that's the, way, that's the way forward. I mean, also, you know, go a bit in a more, do more experimenting, go in a bit of a risk modus as well and try out new things. And um, I think that's good. I think that most of the students I have here for, are from uh, the uh, our partnering institutions from the CUC, from the UCA, and from the UNINET, and all. And mm -hmm. they also focus on uh, entrepreneurship innovation. And also, we had a lot of discussions on the on their countries. And I think, uh, Rudolf, do you would you like to ask a question because uh, uh, Honduras is also one of the uh, regions where again we we discuss quite a lot on entrepreneurship. And um, yes. Uh, once again for being here. Um, I'm particularly interested, I wasn't aware that the central basis for development for green innovation was going to be in Mexico, which is very close to the Central American region where I'm from. Um, there's a lot of potential for green energy in that sector, specifically for solar energy for the you know, high seasons of sun we have throughout the year. So I was just wondering, uh, how do you see entrepreneurship in the region, not only on Latin America, but specifically uh, South America, Central America, and Mexico. Uh, what are your thoughts? How long do you think it takes for these programs to be a success, if so? And um, yes, just wanna, once again, thank you for being here with us. It's a great pleasure. 
Yeah, thank you, thank you for your question. Um, well, I mean, what I just mentioned was really just one project out of 2,000 we are doing in, in peril, right? I mean, I thought it was just a nice example of to illustrate uh, what we're working on. Um, there's quite a few projects in Latin America more generally um, working in the uh, entrepreneurship space, um, but also and specifically, in fact, on, on energy. So what you find sometimes is, as every organization, we have specialists in certain topics. I mean, I'm coming more from the economics and from the finance side. Other people are working on the energy field, other work, people working on environment, others work, working on climate. And in, I, as far as I'm aware, in Latin America, the uh, GIZ's portfolio is, tends to be stronger on the environmental side and on the energy side. But which still means they're, they're coming from that perspective, it might still mean that they are working on entrepreneurship and so on. In, in Mexico, I know for sure, um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, also in Honduras and, uh, and uh, surroundings. So there is a lot of work on, on these things. If you're interested, I'm, I'm very happy to share some more information on that. But more generally, I mean, it's, it's not, it was just one example and it's, it's just one of many initiatives that are happening and normally in collaboration with the, the local government um, in that case. Okay, thank you very much. I would just have to like a follow up since you're saying you're from the financial sector or in more in the economic sector. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, uh, myself, I, I own a couple of startups that work with blockchain technologies and mm -hmm. all of these. Uh, I don't know if there's any uh, assistance or any way we can uh, get in touch or see a broader spectrum of opportunities since uh, there's a lot of big community that's into this space and fintechs and all of this on the Central American region and just to get more information about it. No, that's very interesting. I think we should definitely talk afterwards. would be very good. And if I can't help, I can certainly put you in touch with people. That would be very good. I mean, there's blockchain solutions uh, in, in many contexts, right? I mean, we also work on um, um, insurance issues and so on, where also blockchain is an issue. We've been talking about uh, um, central banks and cryptocurrency issues and so on. So there's a whole host of activities and we're also talking about um, uh, the whole question of how do you incorporate um, verification into uh, global value chains and so on, you know, including also in sustainability issues. So this is the whole host of things. Very happy to talk about it and to put you in touch. Thank you very much. So, Blessing, do you have anything to ask across? Because of the okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask. My question is somewhat uh, related to the crisis currently happening and how uh, the organiza your organization is uh, looking the into question. the energy, green energy. I understand that uh, uh, since 2011, German government has been working towards decommissioning uh, nuclear plants because at that time they were considered as uh, uh, harmful to, to, to the environment. But just recently, due to the uh, conflict happening, there has been some change in uh, policy towards that. So my question is, um, does your organization consider nuclear energy uh, is green energy or, or not? I'm not sure whether we as an organization have an official uh, stance on this. Um, I know that the German government in general would have a stance on that uh, just based on the recent discussions about the EU taxonomy on what is sustainable. So the taxonomy is something that uh, essentially classifies things as being uh, sustainable or not. And uh, there uh, was a big discussion whether uh, nuclear energy should be part of that. And as far as I am aware, uh, the German government said, no, it's not. Uh, whereas other governments said, yes, it is. And in the end, uh, it is right now considered to be green. Um, among my colleagues, I would say within GIZ, we would not consider nuclear energy when we talk about the green transition. So we would talk about renewables in the narrow sense. Some people would classify nuclear as renewable, but it's, in my understanding at least, it's not. And so if we talk about the energy transition, we talk about wind power, uh, solar power, and geothermal probably, um, et cetera, right? I mean, there's also tide, tidal wave power and all kind of things. So it's, it's very varied, but anything that is really renewable in the sense that it occurs all the time, and uh, there's no 
or there's nothing to decommission afterwards that is, is harmful in the broader sense. I mean, of course, also a wind power station at some point you need to decommission, right? But uh, it's a relatively uh, low impact, one would argue, compared to nuclear energy. But that's just my technical view of things and how we, we deal with that. So among my colleagues, you would probably not find anyone who would consider nuclear energy a, a sustainable one. But again, we are, uh, not a, we are a federally owned company, but we are not a political animal. So in this sense, uh, we do not have a political position. If you understand what I mean. So in other words, I cannot give you a, a political opinion here on things. I think uh, on this, uh, just to add on, Daniel, mm -hmm. I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. It also mentions that nu when it comes to nuclear, it's a complete separate unit altogether but because it's under the governance of the IAEA. And the IAEA is in charge for the complete International Atomic Energy Agency is in charge for the complete uh, giving the approvals for every bit of uh, programming and uh, pro proceeding ahead, am I right? And it doesn't come under the green energy itself. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on which position, whose position you take here, right? I mean, different countries have different ideas of what, what it means. And again, the, the, the European Union taxonomy currently says, well, it is part of it. So, but again, I mean, countries take their own decisions, right, on, on these things. So, um, and it depends how you want to go about it. But again, in our work at GIZ, we would not uh, deal with nuclear energy. No. Nuclear energy yeah. altogether. Yeah. How do you find this? Because the industry talks about uh, the, um, um, the green economy is one of the uh, talks which is there. Then comes inside the circular economy which is there mm. and then the blue economy also mm. which is there. Now, uh, I think uh, everybody comes from diverse backgrounds. Now, what is this, the talk of the blue economy and do you feel that uh, this, uh, how is this sustainable uh, how is this able to take ahead? What are the challenges especially in this? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I mean, just to be sure that we're on the same page because blue economy, I think in the original sense also is very closely associated to circular economy. Mm -hmm. Blue economy, as we understand, is mm -hmm. related to the oceans and the mm -hmm. seas. So mm -hmm. the, the sustainable use and sustainable blue economy, we say, mm -hmm. the sustainable use of the, the seas and oceans mm -hmm. in this sense. And uh, for us too, it's something that uh, I actually personally just put on the agenda within our team just one and a half years ago because I felt it's a really important and upcoming topic. Um, I mean, there's a lot of countries that have uh, long coastal lines that are hugely huge, huge dependent on the seas, and the economic use of the seas has only just started. I mean, um, and it's about a lot of things. It's about uh, fisheries, right? I mean, that's one thing, and the depletion mm -hmm. of them. But it's also about uh, offshore wind, for instance, you know? I mean, that's also using that space. But it is also related to protecting the seas and to find the right balance, once again, of using it economically, but using it sustainably. And that's also about pollution. I mean, plastic waste and all these kind of things. And in this sense, it's a huge topic and a huge topic that also cannot really be solved um, country by country, but which uh, really needs an international solution to it as well. And you have the whole issue of you know, climate change, natural disasters, countries in the Caribbean, especially island states and so on. And the whole question of um, what does that mean for the infrastructure development uh, as well? You know, you, you, ideally, you rely on so-called nature-based solutions in doing that. You, you don't get rid of your uh, very precious reef in front of your island because it's a natural barrier. Then you save money uh, because you don't need to build a concrete structure instead. So it's a, it's a very, uh, it's actually a no-brainer, so to speak, but many people have never considered considered that. So it's, um, well, and then you have tourism, you know, I mean, a lot of countries are dependent on tourism um, who are by the seas and then, uh, you know, you have natural disasters and you have um, all of a sudden other uh, aspects like Corona coming into play and uh, it's, so it's a, it's a big issue and uh, what we are trying to do right now is to, to not only look at the environmental and and climate side of things, which was um, really the part that was dominant within GIZ, but we're also trying to bring the economic and the finance aspects of it. I mean, how do you finance that as well, right? And to, to, to see it again as a, as a, as a whole um, thing to, to approach. Uh, what I would like to ask is, um, how, uh, 
being an uh, industry analyst um, uh, as well, because you analyze the industries and then you decide mm. across, and you're also with the ministries. Mm. Now, seeing uh, this one, how do you see this that um, the government is taking the initiatives? Uh, the current government is taking the initiatives and mm -hmm. the support for this. How do you see this? Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think it's all related to the general discussion that we see, well, in Germany, but also in other countries, of uh, how much of an industrial policy we want. And industrial policy here means both domestic one, but also one that is looking out. I mean, I mentioned the example of uh, green hydrogen. In a way, this is also a state-supported uh, initiative. Um, I think the question is probably how far do you want to go? Um, I personally, I believe in, I believe that the private sector does fail sometimes. The and, um, you know, there are market failures. So there is a case and cause for intervention in some cases. But uh, it's the same as with educating your kids. I mean, you, you, you want to nudge them a bit and uh, lead them in the right way, but don't hold their hands all the way through. Uh, and spoon feed them uh, until uh, you know they need to take care of you instead or another 40 50 years so i think if we if if we can if we see that things are not moving on their own and there's a need to push things then there is a case for intervention and if there's not then uh, we should probably not do it and try to solve it with uh, well or market mechanism right i mean a lot of people are talking about the, uh, CO2 markets, uh, carbon markets, and the likes that might, uh, many people have been arguing that for 20 years, you introduce a well-functioning carbon market and everything will solve itself, right? That's the, that's the other school of thought, so to speak. You, you come in with a market mechanism. If the markets are complete, no problem. You, you, you get it solved. Um, fact is, unfortunately, that most of the time it doesn't quite work like that. And that's then when the case comes in for, for intervention here or there. So you mentioned mm. the interventions. The interventions mm. is like when when the uh, in, when the organizations fail, mm -hmm. that's the period of time you need to intervene and check mm -hmm. down where the support needs. Mm. Where the support is needed? Is it the financial support? Is it the policy support? Is it um, any other support or te technology support? Mm -hmm. Where do you think so the intervention is required, and where do you think it la it's lagging inside? Again, I mean, I think there are different schools of thought, even within my organization. I mean, but what, what we believe in general is that we have a so-called three-layered approach where if we go in with projects, we are thinking about three levels. So we're talking about the macro level, which is more the policy side of things, framework conditions and so on. How can we help? How can we support? How do we improve economic governance of a country, right? That people are more inclined to invest. How do we reduce administrative burden and so on? But at the same time, ensure that, well, reducing is not always good because it can come at the cost of, of environmental damage, for instance, if you don't check it well and so on. So that's the macro level. Then we're looking at the meso level, so in between, so to speak, right? And, and that's where you have, uh, well, the entrepreneurial ecosystems, industrial parks and the like. So not individual entities like companies and so on, but, but more agglomerations of things, systems, right? But, but not the government itself, but sort of one level below, uh, service providers for businesses. If you want to stimulate an entrepreneurial ecosystem, it's all fine if you have lots of companies, but if they don't have consulting support, for instance, it doesn't work if the consultants all come from expensive consultancies in, 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 in Germany or the United States, then nobody can pay for them. So you need also that. So it's a whole host of things there. And then you have the, the micro level, which we're talking about the company level, right? I mean, I think one nice example was what I mentioned earlier, is uh, that you would support specific startups. Not that we can support every single startup that's out there that would like to do something, but it's more to have these pilots and to use that as a basis to scale up, to demonstrate that there is a, there's a possibility, that there are champions and that other people see there's an opportunity and maybe more money is coming from elsewhere or maybe uh, the whole thing, uh, you know, all of a sudden becomes supported by the private sector and you don't need to do anything anymore. That's the ideal case, of course. Yes, but I mean, uh, money uh, sometimes too. I mean, that's not, as I mentioned, really our business because at least in Germany, we have a separation between technical cooperation, which was more like consulting and financial cooperation. So financial cooperation here in Germany is done by the um, KFW, so the German Development Bank which, uh, you know, in international terms would be equivalent to the World Bank, for instance, who then provide uh, well, loans, right, or sometimes grants 
to support uh, government-specific projects, uh, maybe power plants, maybe something related to green hydrogen, you know, um, so or maybe schools. Um, could be things like that too, a schooling system, vocational education system, for instance. So that's how ideally it works, right? I mean, that, that GIZ on the one hand and then uh, KFW on the other hand sort of work hand in hand as part of a comprehensive program that is combined. So the GIZ the takes the initiatives and the bank is supporting down for the financial um, I, uh, aids, I, which is done. I, I guess I, I, I could put it like that, but it's, I'm not going to be very popular with KFW in that case. I, it's more that both sides obviously have their own uh, approaches own advantages uh, yeah, exactly approaches. so it is supposed to go hand in hand and everybody is taking the lead on their their things and it uh, is is generally also under the framework of, of very often government agreements so for instance with the government of Malawi or so on and then we go in together and it will be a coordinated approach of uh, essentially the lead is the ministry or the, the embassy and then it would go uh, hand in hand with what is happening on the ground with uh, GIZ, KFW, possibly also others. There are some other specialized agencies supporting that in Germany, um, more specialized ones that would also potentially support, for instance, in the area of mining. Excellent. I think mm -hmm. Ali, yes, Ali, please. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I have two questions, and I'll start with the more major one, I guess. So. We are living through first pandemic in 2020, now the Ukrainian war, and we're seeing probably a recession, uh, at least in the US economy and probably in the European uh, Union. I mean, the first quarter was closed with a minus 1.5 uh, growth of economy, and we're seeing heavy disruptions in the supply chain and people have started using the word deglobalization. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, what do you think about the industrial changes? Do you think that maybe small industries like, um, let's say, textile industries or other small things may return to the uh, major economies, such as the European Union, such as the US, instead of Asian countries because of those supply chain issues. And do you think that we're going to have a recession, uh, a major crisis, something like 2008, in front of us? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let me start with the recession question. Uh, as you know, I mean, economists are notoriously wrong in predicting any kind of things economic. So uh, I can take a guess or not, but um, I, I think, um, I think it's the question is more what happens now with inflation. I think that's a big question. And also what happens with the sustainability of debt here. Uh, and, and I don't mean just Germany, I mean, I mean globally, right? Um, and these two things together, including also what we see uh, in central banks right now, I mean, basically being at zero still and in, in, in interest rates rising so there is not really much economic space in every direction right now to correct things and that's uh, quite critical i mean i think just a year ago everybody was saying well you know inflation is just going to be a temporary issue and it's going to uh, is going to subside again and people were probably right because the ukraine crisis wasn't there but all of a sudden you have that issue of multiple crises and multiple crises don't just mean uh, you have one plus one, but sometimes it's two, and it's normally one plus one equals three. So it means the impact is even more severe. Or if it's really bad, it goes really, you know, up the roof. So I think there's lots of uncertainty. Me personally, I, I'm a bit concerned, quite frankly. Um, I'm I'm concerned because of the price increases um, and what what it means. I also what it means socially for for people everywhere. I think that's what I'm most concerned about. I'm not so much concerned about uh, a lot of rich people uh, <laughs> losing a bit on their savings or something like that, but I'm concerned about people who don't already don't earn much or nothing at all and now have to pay a lot more. So uh, and this is my, my, my concern. And that also can obviously have a feedback effect also if people are really troubled and uh, then this will cause political trouble and that then will cause more trouble on the economic side of things. On your first question, which is obviously kind of related to the uh, global value chains, right? What is happening? Um, 
We are seeing pretty much, I think, the same discussions and the same things that we already saw during Corona. I mean, lots of discussion about reshoring, nearshoring, uh, you know, I mean, these are the things that are happening now. I think what was different then was um, more that people thought in terms of distance, transport costs and, and risk more generally globally. But what we have now is we, we're talking more about a geopolitical fragmentation. So all of a sudden, you probably do not want to source from certain countries anymore simply because they're on the wrong side, to put it very neutrally. Right, um, and these are the discussions that are also coming now from the ministries. They say, uh, and even I, I was in a, a talk with the uh, with somebody from the German Federation of Industries recently, who was one of his main theses and said, "Well, you will, you will have blocks again. You will have economic blocks, and you will be either for these guys or the other guys. And there's the maybe nothing in between." Polarization. Yes, polarization. Exactly. So you're going into that kind of uh, thing. Um, so I think these are two different things, but the one was already happening. I mean, I have a, I have a close friend who is in, in a textile business by, by, by chance, and uh, he's been producing in, uh, in, um, in Spain, uh, because it's a very small business, right? 20 people or so, not much more. Um, then he's been, he was looking at China. I said, what, too expensive? I'm not going there. Doesn't help me much. It's not, it's not much of an advantage anymore. And now he's, um, I think he found a supplier in Bulgaria. So closer to home, uh, not such a high risk and, uh, you know, good workers and uh, still, uh, uh, still good quality and so on. So that was the solution in between. And that's just anecdotal, of course. But I think there are quite a few, like, a few of these stories these days and even including also on more capital intensive production. Harsh, you had a question, right, Harsh? My question is uh, country specific. Uh, I come from Namibia, and uh, Namibia, um, we see in news is about green hydrogen, and it's backed by government, uh, the German government uh, agency. I think also supported by uh, GIZ. Um, what do you think would be the country which would be coming forward quicker, or the? We we hear that uh, you know we would become a net exporter of energy supplies by 2030. Um, so which country is coming ahead in, in this, let's say, race of green energy? Uh, you mentioned Morocco, Chile. Um, so which country would be looked forward to, uh, to deal with or would be forward in this race uh, to produce a better environmental energy? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, hello to Namibia. It's a beautiful country. I've been uh, 20 years ago, so I, and it's, it's a beautiful place, actually, with the United Nations there then. So a uh, very nice country and certainly lots of potential. I mean, I, I'm not uh, somebody who, who's got the metrics in my head and, and now can give you a calculation of uh, where, uh, you know, the economic conditions are the best. But I mean, knowing Namibia as a country that has hardly any clouds, so to speak, uh, plenty of uh, sun and uh, being very stable and at least with Germany having close um, relationships, right, in a, in a way. And it's not that far physically as, as maybe other countries uh, in Latin America and so on. I would say, generally speaking, the conditions are good. But of course, we're not only talking about Germany. There might even be something like um, well, a scramble for resources uh, on that one too, right? I mean, there will be the US who wants to buy. Probably there might be China who wants to buy too and other countries too. So I think it's, it's a mix of, well, there's going to be a bit of a price competition probably and hopefully I think that's also important that countries like Namibia then have a, have a good bargaining position in this whole game and people are not just building up the infrastructure to produce and then the utilization is 10% of it and that doesn't help you either, right? I mean, I think that's, uh, that's a big gamble. I mean, this whole question of now, are we, are we building all these structures everywhere and uh, are we not out-competing each other in this whole game? It's a bit similar, I would say, uh, thinking about it like... Uh, Oil, right? I mean, that's why you have uh, OPEC. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not pleading for a cartel here or anything like that, but in a, in a way, uh, this is maybe a similar, uh, a similar political economy that you will have internationally um, as, as you have with, uh, with um, natural resources before. I mean, all the, you know, the oil and the likes, fossil fuels. Um, 
yeah, but I hope that helps somehow. I mean, I can't predict on, on how well positioned Namibia is in this game, but um, certainly the, the conditions in, in principle should be, should be good ones, right? Um, sorry, I have a follow-up question. Um, they also found recently oil in mm -hmm. the coast of Namibia. Um, would um, your organization be backing more hydro, hydro um, projects? Or more, uh, sorry, uh, environmental green projects to, you know, um, we don't know yet um, if the oil production will be bad for the economy or bad for the environment because Namibia is a very um, strict environment uh, country in terms of respect for the environment. Um, so, I mean, looking at this perspective that there is also a different solution which is not in, in favor of a green economy, um, would you back more projects there with uh, green power? Um, again, I mean, these are discussions that are quite often happening at the governmental level, but in, in principle, I mean, if you have, uh, you know, things looking into oil um, and the government wants to do it, then you will do it, right? Um, and I think in that case, GIZ would still be interested in principle to say, well, you know, to avert the worst, uh, and, 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 you know, there's so many experiences with, with oil production and its, its economic effects, Dutch disease and all these kind of things that are happening quite often. Uh, but there's also the environmental things. And uh, we've been working on these things in, in other countries before. I mean, at least that I think also in, in West African countries and, and elsewhere, uh, even with, with companies, in fact, on behalf of companies to, to look into the social sides of things to ensure that things go well. Uh, but in principle, of course, uh, the, the priority of the government for sure would be more to, to move uh, on the side of the sustainable and the green, the green side um, rather than sort of supporting what is not really supposed to be happening anymore, in the, at least in the view of, of this country, I would say, right? Yeah. 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 Yes. Thank you. And I have a very basic question. So when we are talking about green sustainable growth, so my question is how do we measure it first? What are the main dimensions involved and what are the sort of growth phases involved when we talk about green sustainable growth? This is a very big question. <laughs> it's a very big question, yeah. Um, I think, first of all, on the question green growth and how we, we measure it, I think the, the first question we probably need to ask is, are we all on the same page what green growth really means? In fact, there are some people who would argue we don't really want green growth. In fact, we want degrowth. I mean, because uh, growth is not necessarily good. In fact, we want welfare. We want happiness. I mean, you know, Bhutan has a gross national happiness indicator and, and things like that. Um, it goes a bit back to one of the earlier things I said, um, and there's, there's also uh, national, gross national product accounting for, for green issues, right? I mean, the whole, th the whole question is always whether you really incorporate all the things into your calculations. I mean, our, our calculations here, uh, the, the, the general GDP calculations, they, GDP goes up if you have more uh, cars crashing on the street, right? I mean because then you need to buy a new one when it crashes. So if people are sick more often, because then you need maybe pro more private hospitals and, and so on, and it goes up too. So there's a lot of things that are not already right in this one. And the issue with the gross national accounting also on, on green issues simply is what can you include there? I mean, how precious is your land, for instance? How, how precious is nature? Um, how, what kind of price do you attach to, to nature, to clean air, and things like that? So. But again, I mean, there's, there's a lot of discussions on how far this should go and uh, also what really your, your, your goal system is. I mean, there will be people, maybe politically more on the left, who say, well, let's just be modest and, you know, we are wealthy already here in Germany. Let's just make sure we distribute things better and uh, be modest about it and uh, have uh, one car or even no car rather than three. And, of course, there are others who say, well, how can you say that to somebody in Ethiopia, let's say, who doesn't even have anything to eat, you can't tell them now do some green growth and you'll be happy. And that's a very diffi difficult discussion we're having also uh, at GIZ. Uh, I've been talking very 
directly about how oh, we're, we're doing this work on, on green and sustainable economic development. But in fact, the sort of narrative we need to find when we talk to countries is not that necessarily, because most people do not want as a overall concept necessarily a green economy now. What they would like is, well, help me to get my um, Ministry of Finance into order, help me to uh, feed more people and so on. And the, the challenge is to use these things as entry points as co-benefits of this whole thing, and then take this uh, as, a, as a reform approach to, to go in there. And you, so you're, you're very pragmatic about it, because the challenges vary from countries to countries. Now, what's the yes. challenge in, uh, in the developed nations is, yes. developed, uh, is different from the challenges in the emerging nations. Correct. So they, they have, mm -hmm. For them, it's a different challenge altogether. Economic creation mm -hmm. is for them. So mm -hmm. that's interesting mm -hmm. indeed. So, so I have one more question. Sure. So, uh, when we talk about fundings and investments, okay, and when we are doing international currency transactions, they include taxes, right? So what do you think, do this tax impact, like is it preventing uh, the investors in some way? And uh, are there any, you know, if it is adverse, then what are the coping mechanisms for that? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that uh, it's a plea to say, well, if we get rid of the taxation on that level, then we would have more investment flowing, so to speak. Um, well, I mean, there's uh, different ways of, to look into things, right? I mean, I think normally taxation has uh, a certain purpose. In some cases, it's to avoid speculation, for instance, right? I mean, there's been a long argument for a Tobin tax uh, to, to reduce speculation internationally on, on things and to, to uh, essentially get rid of the st strong fluctuations you have in capital markets by doing that. Um, so there's a, an upside and a downside to everything, I would say, right? Uh, and finding the right balance, and after all, governments need to get taxation from somewhere. But um, I, again, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a decision probably individual governments have to take and, and looking at a, at a balance of what is important to them. I mean, to some, to some economies, international flows are not so important because they have a very strong domestic economy anyway, but others really need the capital coming in from the outside. And sometimes it's dynamic, you know? I mean, looking at, I don't know, dynamic countries like Nigeria, I mean, very often people from Germany would say, well, this is a very poor country, but of course, in, on a lot of poor people, yes, there's also a lot of wealth in some parts and there's a lot of capital around as well. Um, and uh, so there is possibly money to invest. Um, and the problem sometimes is to keep the money in the country. So it's not being invested in, in better investments, say, in, in sometimes in the US or in Europe or somewhere. People think they get a better uh, return risk profile for, for their money rather than investing it locally. And I think that's also partially the challenge to keep the capital in the country and to make sure that domestic capital is also invested domestically and doesn't go elsewhere. Um. Yeah. So I think you had a question, so we could just go ahead. So uh, again, thank you for your time, and we really appreciate you here. And my first question would be on uh, sustainable development goal number nine. This is about uh, industry and innovation. So uh, regarding AI, this is a like, really huge topic recently these days. Um, regarding the industry of AI and how we how we are trying to use AI for manufacturing. Um, what would be your thoughts on the process of, you see, if we use AI to replace uh, human labor, there's a lot of energy involved in this process. There's a lot of uh, energy, energy being used mm -hmm. to replace this, to make this process happen. So what would be your thoughts on how this is going to affect the sustainable development goal? Mm -hmm. So I think if I could just add a few more uh, lines to what he says, mm -hmm. says this. I think uh, this was also one of the things which uh, we all had a discussion across because with uh, the AI coming inside, th there is also one more thing which is uh, the job market is also there because either are there going to be a loss of jobs mm -hmm. uh, or are there going to be a creation of jobs Mm -hmm. The second thing, again, which he also puts across is that the artificial intelligence coming and said now more industries are going to be dependent on the IoT industries uh, uh, coming and said so thereby there's going to be an increased usage of energy. Mm -hmm. So how do you see this overall picture on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what you mentioned is very similar to the discussions we have also um, 
on cryptocurrencies, for instance, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a similar a similar issues. Where, whereas, you, well, you could obviously argue that AI has a productive use. Cryptocurrency, some might argue that it doesn't have a productive use. So that's probably even more critical in this case. In this case, it's probably a, a trade-off. Um, I mean, it's it's a transition. Things are changing. I mean, again, there are different opinions on this, I think, uh, and what it means. Some people say, well, technology at all costs is great. It's wonderful if we should do it. Other people say, no, 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 technology, new day, no, no. Everything is good the way we had it before, and please don't innovate, don't change things. I mean, we had so many, we had so many uh, small and big industrial revolutions in the past where people were arguing all kinds of things. And yes, there are losers, there will be losers, and there, uh, there will be shifts, and yes, maybe there will be more energy spent on that, and, but yes, energy costs might rise, and people will find probably uh, more efficient ways of operating things. And uh, you know, sometimes people are actually very smart at uh, being innovative about stuff when the need is there, otherwise they can be rather lazy. So I think if the drive is there, it will happen. Um, but again, there can be there are different opinions on that, right? And uh, for sure, on your question also on on jobs, um, well, as with every disruption, as is with every industrial uh, revolution, uh, yes, jobs will be stuff. will be lost. And, uh, and there are two aspects to this, of course. There's the the individual issue, and that is a big issue for the individual, of course. And that's a big issue not only for the individuals, for the families. It's for the for the local community quite often, and sometimes it affects an entire area. I mean, we had that in the also here in, in Germany in the coal regions and uh, same in the US in the coal and steel regions, uh, things have changed. So this is, this is a big issue and it's a big personal issue also for, for many people and because of that it becomes political. So it should not be forgotten that these people influence political opinion yeah. and it might in fact backfire and then destroy the transformation process because people are demonstrating on the streets. This is what we've seen in, in many developing countries where they uh, got rid of fossil fuel subsidies, for instance, right? So should you still do it? Uh, well, it, again, it depends, right? I mean, fossil fuel subsidies, for sure, you should probably get rid of it um, and uh, put the money elsewhere to good use. Um, but then you have the, the bigger picture. So uh, as a society, and then you have this whole issue that a policymaker always, the choices policymakers need to do, it's, it's always trade-offs and uh, finding the right balance and finding the right uh, optimum in terms of welfare, uh, that's uh, for the decision makers uh, to take. And um, in economic terms, what you should do is in this case, you compensate the losers. So you make sure that people well, either get monetary uh, compensation, but this is not necessarily what people want. Uh, people want a job that is meaningful. People want, uh, you know, they want to be still where they are. They don't want to move uh, 500 kilometers somewhere else where they have no connection. So. I think that has to be seen, and that gives us. This is the whole label: the just transition, right? I mean, how do we, how do we design this transformation in a way that is also uh, just, and that um, then is ultimately supported by everyone? That's also the, the crucial thing. You believe in that transformation, and that's why you need to ensure that you get support from it, and uh, in the long run also, and that people have the vision and to see that there's a change that makes sense. Uh, for everyone. And that's very tricky, of course, because people will be affected. Some people will be affected everywhere, left, right, and center. And you need to build the skills, right? That brings me back to the point earlier on green skilling. You have all of a sudden a new skill set. That's the same for AI as with, uh, you know, again, simple things like servicing a photovoltaic uh, uh, thing. I mean, here in Germany right now, apparently you have a shortage now of energy advisors for uh, insulating your homes because everybody wants to do it now all of a sudden, rising costs. Where do these people come from all of a sudden? We don't know, right? So, and to have that foresight and um, to go into this with a long-term vision is, is very important. But you need that direction and then you need to make sure that you're taking people along on that transition path. I think that's where uh, we always mention this, that uh, the economy is again like connected to politics. So the economic oh, yes. shocks will always be felt on the political governance as well and uh, it could be the best or like it could be criticized which could be there and yes i think you have a question please so thanks a lot for being here and uh, my question is the main objective of any business is to just to make profit so as an existing entity private entity or an organization so who wishes to change to green transition have to invest a large amount of money so which, which eventually increases the expense 
So are the consumers or customers are really ready to pay the increased price under the name sustainable? Uh, because I believe due to this recession, people are reluctant to spend more money. So is this the right time to, in, to implement green transition? So I just wanted to look at that. No, it's a very, it's a very, it's valid very, very nice question. It's a very, very, inside. very valid question for sure. Yes, um, I don't have the figures, but I, I mean, I guess an easy example is always how many people buy organic products, right? I mean, let's face it, why not buy it if you have the money, right? I mean, it's apparently it tastes better, it is good for the environment, it's good for everyone. Why shouldn't you buy it, right? Except for the price, but I, I don't think more than. 10% in Germany buy it, and even if they could afford it, they would probably not do it because people are price conscious, as you said. Um, I think uh, they've done a lot of tests also on these kind of things, how people choose between two different products. Would they go for one or the other, and how much price difference uh, you know you really need in there? So it's a, it's a tricky question, yes, and not many people yes, can, cannot, cannot afford it. So um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very tricky one. In fact, sure. just to add to this, in fact, I, I remember this phrase very well when Renault was asked this question. Renault, Renault was asked this question mm. at that time. Carlos Ghosn was there, this says mm. the CEO. And I remember when this question was put across, he put one thing stating that uh, uh, today uh, consumers will not purchase a car because of the reason that it's climate friendly. Uh, mm. consumers, consumers will not buy a car which is climate friendly and pay more money. Rather, consumers will always prefer a car which is worth the cost. And thereby, when we have a higher cost, which is adding inside this, then there has to be a government subsidy which should come inside to support the industries, at least in the initial phases. And thereby, uh, uh, the consumers will always be bothered about the cost which is there when the cost is increasing, they would not be willing to spend across. But again, I believe if I'm right, I think you may correct me. Uh, this is where the government needs to encourage more with the subsidies and support down the industries in the initial run. Uh, do you feel so? Um, again, I think it's a bit of uh, something that you, you can look at two different ways, right? Um, I think there's two things. One is, uh, the subsidy itself, and the second thing is who gets the subsidy ultimately. And I think the issue sometimes is that unfortunately the subsidy goes to those who don't really need it um, necessarily or would have bought it anyway. I mean, quite frankly, right now electric vehicles are almost like a status symbol. So you would rather buy an electric vehicle um, from a lesser brand, let's put it this way, than uh, you know to to go for that expensive uh, um, other other brand. I'm not mentioning any <laughs> that um, that that, but that has a, an engine in it. So I mean, just cycling through Berlin and the more affluent areas here, everywhere you see the electric vehicles. All of a sudden, uh, I don't think I see them that much in in the areas that are less affluent. Uh, so um, something is happening here. Uh, what has to be seen too, though, is that uh, a lot of things can be done through price. Uh, I think as, an, as economists and business people, we think too little about the psychology of things. Um, I think there is now some kind of dynamism here. You know, everybody talks about sustainability. So it's, if you're not sustainable, then you're not the good guy anymore, right? So it's a bit like that. And it's the same thing with the cars. At some point, uh, people will look at you and like, look at this guy with this, uh, you know, so it's this, a society this, that a nice forces guy. people to and, change. And this societal change, and I think that tipping point we've probably reached already. And in this sense, maybe also subsidies can be justified to really push people above to that tipping more. point where, where the opinion flips. Matters. And that, that is an interesting one. And I, uh, I think there's, I mean, fortunately, people are looking into this now, behavioral economics and all these things, much more than they used to. But it's something that's very often overlooked, I think, how, how important is also what is happening psychologically also within society as a whole in, in this process. And who knows, maybe things change. Maybe we all of a sudden think, well, um, I'm so used to going to the discounters here in Germany because they have cheap food. And my assumption is I spend 10% of my household income on, on food. But they might, might also turn it Italian. I don't know how much Italians spend on it, but for sure Italians cherish food more than, than Germans do. I can say that. And maybe they, they think, well, it's well worth uh, spending 20% or 30% of my, of my household income on food instead and rather save on, 
I don't know, those plastic gadgets I don't need for my kids anymore or whatever it is and uh, reallocate simply my preferences. I mean, I think this is also kind of happening right now with the, your generation, right? I mean, uh, it's become much more important to, to enjoy life more, to, to probably work a little less and not to be stressed so much, not so much about prestige and all these things and much more about being yourself and um, living for the here and now and all these kind of things. And, uh, you know, that might also bring these changes along. And more towards the entrepreneurial way. Yeah, than sure. the laborers working there. Yeah. Rudolf, you have this question, Rudolf, you may ask, please. Should I wait for the mic? Yeah, I, I just like if you could. Abhinav, you want to ask? Oh. Proceed. Next. Thank you. Hello once again. Um, right now that we're on the topic, I'm just very interested on your takes on our solutions like the universal basic income and what do you think it will pay into the economic development for whether it's emerging nations, developing countries already established, you know, uh, countries that, that ruled on, like G20 countries. What's your take on the universal basic income? If this is a viable solution, as we see places like, like uh, Belgium taking these four days for work nowadays, and if this really uh, comes out as a solution. And secondly, just uh, reviewing on the GIZ webpage, I've become interested on the Academy for International Cooperation. If you could. Uh, explain us what it is about, how does it work, and uh, you know why it's in there. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, on the Academy of International Cooperation, this is in a way uh, a bit like a training center. It's actually based in Bonn. And uh, traditionally, because GIZ is a result of a merger of three organizations, and the uh, training academy was part of uh, the, uh, one of them that was focusing on collaboration, not just with developing countries, but actually also with others. So, um, in fact, people like me also, when we go abroad on postings, we would be trained there on all kinds of aspects from uh, cultural training, uh, you know, how, how to greet people in, in China, for instance, and things like that. You know, you do a three-day uh, three training on that, or you get um, another uh, refresher on your economic or political skills and so on. But that's also open for, for international uh, people if they would like to, to join there. And it's got a whole host of training programs, obviously corona-related a little um, I think uh, tricky over the past one or two years, I think, but uh, happy to connect you there too. On universal basic income, I guess there's also very different th schools of thoughts there on, on uh, whether it makes sense or not. Um, I followed the discussion quite closely, I think about three, four, five years ago already, and, and including also actually in discussions, uh, the margins of G20 meetings and so on, because I was involved in some of these um, supporting processes. Um, and was being pushed quite strongly. I kind of feel that it's gone a bit quiet on it, as a comparatively f three, four years ago uh, in terms of discussions. Um, I'm not sure whether it's because um, there are more and more calculations that sometimes show it's not really affordable for many countries. I think uh, on Switzerland, they've done something like that and they calculated that uh, um, it's, it's simply not feasible. Um, Again, I mean, I haven't done the calculations myself, nor, nor maybe can I do them myself, but um, it's, in my opinion, an, a very interesting proposition and uh, a very interesting idea, including also for welfare states that have so many different things to support people in a very bureaucratic way sometimes. I'm not naming any specific country here, but there are sufficient countries that have a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of complications to really deliver uh, support to people and having this all in one payment, so to speak, uh, and then uh, let people decide if they want to top it up or not is, for me personally, is, 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 an, is a nice idea, let's put it this way. Um, is it feasible? Maybe for some countries, maybe for some not. No? Um, um, the more capital we have, uh, a capital in terms of uh, economic terms, as in productive capital, right? And the more you would think, see artificial intelligence, the more you would think, well, at some point, the factories are largely running on their own and producing the goods you need, and uh, they will pay for all that somehow. The issue is maybe that, unfortunately, we are all very competitive animals globally, including the nations, and if you do that and you just let your existing machinery run and uh, a few uh, very active people still innovate here and there, you're probably going to lose out against those who are uh, working harder. I mean, and that's, I think, 
the, the, in my thinking, the key issue. You have a geopolitical con situation in there, and uh, it's uh, yeah, you, you can't, you will fall back if you rest. It's 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 still the hamster wheel, you know. You keep you have to keep running, unfortunately, in some cases, uh, because that's how humans work. Um, it's a rather philosophical answer, I guess, to your question, but I hope it. Uh, Thank useful. you. No, philosophy yeah. is the basis <laughs> of all knowledge, so it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yes, Natasha. Um, do you have any questions? Oh. Um, so, sir, uh, when we talk about bringing on the sustainability, so there are some changes to be made. So I believe that apart from just, uh, and when I'm talking in terms of technological sustainability change, what do you think, what are the changes which should be made incrementally as well as radical? In terms of bringing sustainability forward? Yeah, mm -hmm. incrementally as well as radical changes. What do you think, what other changes should be involved? Are you specialized in the difficult questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can start with the, the big ones, ones. yeah. <laughs> um, well, okay, let's, let's look again first at uh, sustainability. What, what do we have in there? I mean, in my understanding, it always involves the, the environmental and climate side. Uh, but also the social side. So we are not just having big uh, wealth disparities and so on. And it also involves, in the original sense, the governance side. So ensuring that we have the right institutions in place that ensure that this sustainability is sustainable in this sense. And you might add these days resilience, right? I mean, uh, are we really able to cope with shocks of all kinds? Are we able to bounce back if something happens? If, you know, we have this trajectory and all of a sudden there's troughs and can we really bounce back out of this? Are we going all the way down? So sustainability so we i think what we certainly see on a more national scale is is this, uh, on the side of energy and more broadly infrastructure um, so I many energy is just one part of infrastructure if you will the whole the whole part uh, but you're also talking about in my in my thinking also a, a rethinking of how transport works for instance because a lot of um, a lot of greenhouse gases uh, you know they are being produced as part of the construction or the operation of of streets of of anything right um, and the other thing is is buildings um, and that's where we have because a lot of energy is lost also because of poor insulation existing buildings is a big issue too um, and how we how we build things and even the fact that we build things obviously consumes a lot of energy so i think there these are probably the the, the, the key levers um, what is probably going to happen more, and that can be done if you want to, you can do that in a, in a big bang, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I would say this is in a way happening right now, to, at least here in Germany, to a certain extent. Again, driven by the Ukraine, I mean, propelled, I, I wouldn't say driven, but propelled by the Ukraine crisis now. Uh, maybe not so much on the infrastructure side more generally, like a road and so on. Um, and on the incremental side i mean i find it interesting what i mentioned earlier on the what do people think how do people behave how can you change behavior and i think that that's is much like more subtle and that's much more gradual i would say i mean sometimes you know sometimes there's a tipping point whoops it goes very fast but uh, at the beginning it's always gradual and um i think you this is something that does not necessarily um, come from, from, from the government. I mean, we've, we've been talking a lot about the government, but I think there is now a good momentum within the general population and within uh, of all kind of leaders, right? Business leaders and business leader, I mean a small corporation with five people as well. I mean, you know, they're leading their people, they're leading their own company and they maybe they start saving energy or encourage their, their staff to, um, you know, uh, give them a bike, uh, bike, a free bike instead of uh, don't know subsidy for for their petrol or, or company cars or things like that right I mean these are small things and they can come from every each and every one and uh, I think we have a certain momentum there but there too of course you can provide incentives right you can say well if you provide your employees with a bicycle that's going to be tax deductible expense or whatever you know and uh, these are the kind of things one one can do also at the government side so there's uh, quite a lot that you can actually do with uh, fiscal policy, in, in my thinking, if you want to. 
but it's it's really also about you know even you guys you know spreading the gospel and so on go out there and say well you know why don't you do this and speak out and uh, sometimes it's just uh, people do things a certain way one doesn't want to stand out and thinks everybody is this way and I'm the odd one out here but sometimes it's just to be stand up and be a leader in an individual situation and and bring things forward. So everybody here is a leader to bring things forward. In fact, Daniel, just to add on, since you said that, why don't uh, they do it? Uh, I, I was uh, indeed with blessing, like with the CUC when we did projects or like with um, uh, your batch, the recent works that everybody came down with business ideas. Every business idea that came inside was something which was focusing on the sustainable ideas which has been there. And that's where I, I, I myself spoke to the batch uh, of students and I said this, that I'm amazed to hear this because two years back, the ideas that came inside was different, which I heard. And now after two years, every business idea that's coming inside is something which is focusing on, which is betterment of the societal needs. Mm -hmm. And that's where every idea is moving ahead from from the f idea of farming to any idea which is coming inside. And that transformation has come inside uh, with the business schools creating the awareness, with the society creating the awareness, with the industries evolving. Mm -hmm. That's something which I, I yeah. myself have noticed this across on the skill development side. Which is well, the fact that we are talking here about this topic, you know, is also something new, I That's would say. That's spreading, yes. Yeah, sure. Indeed. I mean, yeah. And uh, in, uh, in, yes, Abhinay, you have a question, Abhinay? Yes, Abhinay, please. So, first of all, thank you for coming here. And uh, like uh, uh, throughout the session, you were discussing so many things. Uh, uh, like, uh, you, as you mentioned that you were working with uh, nearly 130 countries. So I believe that uh, it, you have been worked with both developed countries and emerging countries as well. So in the uh, see when when we talk about sustainability, so we you have worked multiple projects. So did you happen to see any uh, uh, pattern towards uh, developed countries or uh, emerging countries, whatever it may be? Like uh, uh, this is the thing which uh, I I have you have you guys have been seeing throughout the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think first of all we cannot say that just because a country is, is big and on an economically uh, successful growth path that they necessarily embark on a sustainable growth path, right? And sometimes there are big surprises too. Um, I mean, take a country like Costa Rica, right? It's relatively small, Well, one would say it's already fairly well developed. Uh, f uh, officially it's not yet. Uh, it's um, it's uh, one of the prime examples of, uh, of a, of a well-run uh, green country, right? Mm -hmm. um, actually more advanced than most of the industrialized countries. Um, then you have other countries like China who, um, you know, I worked in China for a while and uh, I left the country because, uh, because of the air quality, quite frankly. So uh, for the health of my kid. So I, I, I had a choice, other people didn't have the choice. So. Um, and I think, but I think that China has done uh, an amazing job right now, right, just to, to, to get things going on the environmental and climate side. Mm -hmm. The willingness is there, the pressure is there also from the population because they feel the same as I did then. Um, and then you have other countries, I'm not sure I can name a good example now, but what kind of you know, moderately successful in what they're doing, but they still don't really feel the need to do it because maybe they have natural resources and so on, or mining resources and so on. And if you're looking for a pattern, we'd we'll probably say it's good governance, good leadership. You have a, sometimes it's just one president who is so good at ensuring that this is the way I want to go. And in the process, I'm going to make sure that my country is, uh, has a better governance overall, right? Which you also one does also one country which is progressing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Well. So, I'm just yeah. adding on to that question to be very specific, like, uh, how, how do you see that uh, the sustainability is, like, uh, growing uh, towards the developed countries or, like, emerging countries, where it is, like, can you say numbers or like that? Where it's particularly good? right now. Uh -huh. 
uh, out of the top of my head, I mean, there's index indices on these things, right? I mean, I don't have it here right now, but I think there's a, a lot of different ways of, of looking at that too, right? I mean, and again, it's a matter of interpretation, what you consider to be sustainable or not. Um, but there are scorecards. I mean, I think a, a good way to look at it is probably also even at the SDGs. There's SDG rankings, and then you can look at the, the achievement levels and so on and how people have performed. Uh, you see individual country profiles uh, and so on, and you, you see how uh, what people have pledged that they want to achieve and where they are right now. It's, I think, probably the the most well-respected commonly framework, common framework that people would agree on that this describes, broadly speaking, uh, sustainable economic development in all its facets. Right? Yeah. Okay. Ali. Uh, I have multiple questions because this discussion is really interesting and uh, valuable for me, but I'm going to stick with the most pragmat pragmatic one. So the question is, uh, if a founder wants to cooperate with GIZ here in Germany mm -hmm. on a uh, climate tech, so in recycling, which mm. Germany is upfront, but uh, in some spaces really lacking some carriage. Mm -hmm. So, how can that founder seek support in GIZ? Mm -hmm. Is he even able to do that? As you have mentioned, you're working mostly with SMEs. So, what is the pipeline for that? Um, it depends a little on what you're focusing on. I mean, because we are obviously directed at emerging and developing countries. So, if your business model and ideally, if yourself are based in a developing or emerging country, then this is of interest to us. Having said that, we have cooperations with the private sector and frameworks for that um, through so-called uh, DEVELOP, as in PPP, public-private partnership arrangements, where uh, companies can apply um, for funding um, that comes out of the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development um, and then everybody chips in half. Quite often the, the company then is kind of um, the, the, the work that goes into it is then considered to be the contribution on their side and then there's going to be consulting budget or other things coming in from GIZ to do uh, things together. Tends to be uh, larger uh, initiatives. I mean it's, it's very often big, big German companies or, the, or European companies I should say qualify, not just German. European companies and it's trying to address uh, market failures essentially I mean if, if there's a case to say uh, I, I would my company would not normally do this because it doesn't make sense from a profit point of view but if we get that additional money and support we'd be keen to do it and then we say well we do it because we see a wider public benefit in this which does not only accrue to your company but because you know, it's something that helps everyone. Very often it's about sometimes value chains, how you source your, well, vegetables or something like that from a certain country or, you know, fair trade aspects. But it can also be other things. We work with a Swedish bank on green bond market development, you know, to promote green bonds. Um, because for them it was not um, so interesting and they didn't really have the capacity to go around globally and uh, promote that. But we went with them to China, to Mexico, uh, South Africa, India, and so on to, to build capacity and that's ecosystem that you need around green bonds to, in, to actually issue them right, locally. So this, this would be a framework, but we also have sometimes we have um, challenge, challenge fund calls and things like that where we uh, on hacks and all these things, hackathons. So there's these kind of initiatives happening here also in Germany, as long as they're focused on solutions for developing and, and emerging economies. And that then is a, very similar to the usual incubator, accelerator kind of things. Then you can pitch your ideas, you, you might make it to the next round. Normally they want teams and, uh, and, and it continues. Yeah. But again, I mean, please feel free to get in touch and then I, I can try and, and link you up with people. It's not exactly my field because that's more people who specifically focus on working with the private sector also in Germany. There's a, there's a special team on that. Uh, and there's others who are dealing with these uh, innovation type hubs. But I think Daniel, if I now. would like to ask you on this, since we are sharing on what Ali has mentioned, 
uh, students are from business backgrounds and they mm -hmm. uh, uh, they have diverse backgrounds. Uh, Aziz has got project management, has, got, mm -hmm. has been working with Motorola for a long period of time. Uh, innovation has been something which has been a part of this. And since GIZ being one of the leading organizations, uh, could they have work along with in the areas of internships or in terms of business uh, incubation um, centers? Or are there any platforms where the business students could get involved along with? Um, generally, we are all, always very keen on people who are uh, on the, in the field of innovation. Um, digital is also a, a big theme right now. It's not my team directly right now, but uh, we have a very big and growing team that is looking at uh, digital uh, innovation topics and uh, very keen on, on talents, diverse talents of all kinds. Um, so uh, very welcome uh, how, in general. How do they go about with uh, with their projects, and how do they t take this initiative along with, if if need be so? Mm -hmm. So for for internships, for instance, or work placements and the likes. Yeah, I mean even jobs, I guess, right? I mean, um, of course, I mean they are the official channels. Normally, uh, it's a very transparent process. Normally, any internship is advertised uh, externally. So there's a the job site. Uh, it's normally about 30, 40 jobs and new ones coming through every day, so it's it's really plenty. Um, but it's always possible uh, to to send in a CV uh, if you know the right person or you know, know the area that you you're interested in. It's worth doing a bit of research, of co of course, beforehand on the on the internet to see what kind of area you might be interested in. Um, I'm also happy to receive uh, CVs if you want to, and um, if uh, it doesn't fall in my area of of uh, responsibility, I can forward them. Uh, again, there still needs to be uh, a formal process. We're taking these uh, HR and governance and transparency issue very seriously. So uh, there would have to be an official uh, job ad then afterwards. But um, uh, it's already good to you know just be there and uh, have talked to someone in the, in the first place. And again, this is not only in Germany, right? I mean, here uh, in Berlin, actually, there we are not so many. We are mainly in in Bonn and near Frankfurt. Uh, but there's also the opportunity to work abroad uh, in the country offices. And uh, again, this is in, in most countries there is someone. And sometimes there it's a little more flexible in terms of how you can approach people. And I think it's mainly, if I'm just putting across, because GI is uh, one of the leading organizations. And like it's not just the leading organization. It's, it's a huge, powerful organization with, which is there. And... Um, it, since uh, it's on all the sectors which is bound to be there from innovations, project managements to uh, the climate change and thereby uh, the ideas could always be uh, shared across with the organizations because as much as your ideas need to be shared, they also want uh, your ideas to uh, reach across. That's where uh, it, it leads to the whole activity to proceed ahead. And uh, as we just end this session, uh, if there are any uh, last few questions, we can always take down. And uh, uh, you have one? And uh, yes, yes, proceed. Saina, do you want to sign up? You want um, sir, uh, what are Aziz, um, you the ask? modern you or innovative you know, financial mechanism, financing mechanism? Uh, existing so as to bring about this sustainable change can you name them or mm -hmm. I mean one one I think I mentioned already um, is the the green bonds for sure I mean and we're talking about corporate bonds so for corporations as well as, as sovereign green bonds for you know for governments as a whole um, because they they combine obviously those projects that uh, have uh, only a specific green objective or uh, according to certain certain criteria. So that's one. And that was probably really the starting point, at least in the financial market side, for things. And this is now expanding. I mean, we're talking about gender bonds, for instance, now, right? It's focusing specifically on gender issues. Um, and there's also the whole question of social impact bonds. And uh, But more generally, um, also looking at sustainability. So there's a lot of branding right now happening. I, mean, I used to work in the financial sector. I know that it's part of the game to diversify your asset classes, so to speak, and it is always good to have different types because it looks good in your portfolio. So there's also a bit of a marketing spin behind this, I would, I would like to argue, but um, 
generally speaking, this is a, is a, good, in, a good development. And uh, as we can see from the, the interest rates that they get, I mean, it's essentially cheaper financing these days mm -hmm. to have a, a finance through a green bond than through a, a normal one. Um, Germany has actually tested that, and we assisted, in fact, the Ministry of Finance in, in, in getting the first green sovereign bond out. So they issued uh, parallel bonds, exactly identical, essentially, except that one is green, the other one is not. And the green one is uh, outperforming the other one mm -hmm. on, and is cheaper. So it's, it's a very nice demonstration case for that. So that's one thing. Um, but another one that uh, also comes up, of course, I mean, is impact investing. Mean, it's not a financial product, but impact investing is something that we see, that we look into. Um, and I also mentioned nature-based solutions uh, is another one. I mean, how, how do you fund and compensate countries that are making use of um, what they have, nature, as opposed to building a new dam or something like that? Um, I think these are just a few things. And, but then you obviously also have the digital space, and, uh, and that's maybe not so much on the, on the environmental side, but maybe more on the, on the social side. How do you reach out to the people who are not, don't have access to bank accounts, right? I mean, there's a lot happening there. Um, and it's not just fintech, it's mobile banking still and all these kind of things. Uh, insurance space too, farmer's insurance. You know, there's a weather event happening. Uh, you use a blockchain somehow and uh, the event occurs and the payment goes on your mobile phone directly, uh, reducing, bypassing all the paperwork and the, the transaction work and the verification that needs to happen. So a lot of interesting things happening right now, I think. Yeah. Excellent. I think. Um, Z, yeah. Yeah. Pass the mic down so that. Yes, Saina. Saina has an aerospace engineering background, so yes, Saina. Yes. Hello, thanks uh, once again for the discussion. Uh, my question would be regarding uh, change management. As we know, politics and economics are two um, tightly interdependent uh, subjects. So uh, when a country um, changes their uh, president or the government changes, like the thing is going on in Afghanistan, the Taliban has the power now, uh, what's your organization's um, action would be? What kind of actions do you take to manage this change? Mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, one would hope that a change from one government to the next is not bringing a radical change. Sometimes it happens, right? Uh, but more generally, and that's also valid for, for Germany even, if you have a transition, in fact, the technocracy, so the people who are ultimately doing the day-to-day -day work in ministries and elsewhere, most of the time they don't change. What changes are the top people. and. Uh, what happens quite often is a relabeling of things, um, and uh, the substance quite often remains similar. Um, so that's the ideal case, right? So I think in that sense, if you have good and sound relationships and uh, a common understanding of which way you want to go in your transition path, and um, everybody's on the same line, then, then things are fine. I mean, to get there is already a challenge. So that, that has to be in place. That alone is already the main challenge, in fact, actually to get there, that you're on the same page and that you're moving in the same way, direction. Of course, if you then have a radical change, you know, really, uh, let's just say, generally speaking, an extremist government coming in where you think uh, it cannot be supported from, from a human rights point of view, right? I mean, then it's obviously a decision by the government to say what we do. We are federally owned enterprise so we follow the government's line it's not that we take political decisions in that end we might take a decision to evacuate our staff or to uh, uh, to uh, to maybe seize uh, cooperation with with an organization because we find it's not safe anymore or it will endanger achieving our objectives if we do but we are very uh, technocratic about it and we have to be because we are not the political decision makers uh, maybe you've seen that in, in some of my other responses. Um, I'm not really in a position to actually say anything that is, is on the political, political side of things. Political perspective. But um, because the decisions are not taken by us, we are, we are a service provider, if you will. And even though we are government-owned and we have a very close connection to the government, which helps in many ways because it gives a very a, a, a much stronger access, 
these decisions, uh, the, the more crucial decisions, are taken elsewhere. If it's about achieving the objectives of a project, that's a different matter. Then we have the leeway to say, look, um, it does not make sense to work with Ministry X, Y, Z anymore because we believe they are going in a completely different direction and it's a waste of money and a waste of everybody's time to continue to do, though, do so. Then, then we would also uh, get the feedback from ministries or from the embassy even and say, okay, this is how we're going to proceed and we'll not take this any further. That was actually very, uh, very interesting, very informative because a lot of countries had invested in the country and then like when the government changed, especially in, in certain cases uh, like that, it led to a very colossal loss and it was completely unclear. India was also one of the countries that invested huge in Afghanistan and then it was all lost. So the money which they invested, they could not claim back. Or like the projects also, how it went ahead. So that was, uh, Aziz, you have one question. Yes, Aziz, please. Yeah. Aziz. Hello, my name is Aziz, and um, thank you very much for being here. And uh, I came from an engineering project management background, which is a tough combination when it comes to uh, green and sustainable. Because from one end, I, I, I need to uh, look at the, um, uh, the cost aspects of things. Uh, I need to see what, wh how do you think that the, um, and did you face this situation before that uh, you compared the, the cost of a project, for example, being green and not green, and you convinced the business owner or the, the sponsor to go green rather than not green? I, I guess this is a challenge, and uh, I mean, did you, did you face something like that before? And how did you actually manage to uh, convince the business owner to go green? Yeah, I have, I have some uh, very simple examples, and they're actually from, from way back. Um, we, we used to have, I'm not sure we, we still have it, an approach that's called environmental cost-based uh, uh, management. So, um, and in this case, it was um, in China to convince people to use new methodologies um, on production um, to save resources, essentially. And in this case, it was to change the way they would cut out pieces from, from a big sheet of leather, I think, um, because there's always redundancy, right, depending on how you cut it. And so there's an easy argument to say, well, it, it makes economic sense. And uh, by the way, on the side, you also save the environment. They didn't really care probably about that part, but that was the entry point. I mean, maybe that's an easy, maybe that's an easy one. But there are more of these solutions, I think, than people sometimes think if they just start thinking about it. Uh, very often people don't think. And the, the, I mean, I think the nice thing about it is uh, by, by having that additional, well, ultimately it's a constraint in your, in your way of operating business. By having that constraint, all of a sudden you're forced to think differently and to think afresh and to think anew. And in that process, maybe you have a new idea. I mean, that sounds theoretical, but I think you know what, what I mean. It's, it, I think that's a worthwhile thing. So sometimes it's difficult because it is, but I think it's more about the time frame, and it's about your discount factor. I mean, you do your net present, ultimately you would do a net present value calculation, right? When you look at uh, what you want to invest and and, um, and it is, as you know, I mean, it's very strongly affected by a discount factor you put in there if, if it pays off or not and when it pays off, right? Yeah. So and that, and, and that discount factor is, is very much related also to your sustainability considerations sometimes. So it's a tricky one, but uh, as every good management consultant, you would be able to show anything you want. Yeah. But uh, the conviction, I mean, to convince people then in that context is, is sometimes the tough one. But it is about the, the, I think the time horizon is, is a big question always. Okay. Aziz was with uh, uh, Motorola, with the project yeah. management. He was there prior. And I have a couple of questions before we end the session, which has come down on YouTube, the virtual uh, session participants have asked. Uh, Gilbert from Ghana has asked this question, stating, what's the magnitude of the challenge that green transition poses to the energy companies and their human resource? So what's the magnitude of the challenge that poses uh, that the green transition is posing to the energy companies and the human resource with the energy companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I suppose you are, uh, you're referring to super majors and the likes, right? I mean, the, the, big, the big oil producers and so on. Um, I think 
uh, many of them have been uh, smart enough to early on already uh, diversify. Um, I mean, you've seen ads already, I think, five, six years ago from the big oil companies saying, well, we're investing in wind power now, we're doing this and that. And in this sense, um, I think, uh, and also in terms of cash resources and so on, they're probably quite uh, well positioned. Um, I mean, the irony right now is um, that uh, everybody thought that oil would be a stranded asset, right? I mean, four or five years ago, people were, again, they were talking about uh, scenarios already that some banks would go bankrupt because they had, uh, their, their portfolio was too strongly invested in, in oil companies or, or mining companies or, or others that um, would eventually be stranded and nobody, uh, you know, can make use of it anymore. So, uh, and there are still some of them, but now you, what you have is you have a resurgence in, in the oil price, right? And all of a sudden, uh, not just uh, corporations, but also co uh, countries uh, uh, getting all the windfall profit from it. Um, so things sometimes go funny, let's put it this way. And um, there's also been a trend that um, things that are divested uh, on the oil side, that they are being picked up by private investors that are not public anymore, so that are not, uh, you know, in the, in the limelight of, um, of global media attention, which is also in a way problematic because um, now it's probably a dirtier business than it was before. So I would say, generally speaking, you could say uh, a well-governed company is one that is sustainable. And if it's well-governed, it will probably be uh, also a, a sustainable company because they would have considered that from early on. And that's why also, I think, in, in quite a few stock market indices, mm. those that are sustainable are sometimes performing better yeah. uh, because it's, in a way, a proxy for good governance in a company that you have considered it. At least now, I would say, it is. Yeah. And I think there's one uh, last question. If it, uh, Shazia Majid has this question that pandemic has had such an effect on the whole world. Uh, how it has affected the green economy? and how affordable it will be for the industrial market at the grassroots level. And uh, she would also like to add if we can compare the general public and for the industries, especially pandemic and how has the impact been there for the green industries? Has it pushed it ahead or has it affected? I, I would say that the uh, pandemic has diverted attention from the uh, transition. Transition. Having said that, as I mentioned earlier, there was, uh, I mean, we talked about that window of opportunity that we now have because of the recession and because of the way things go to build back better, to have a green recovery. I think that we can say. But again, then we have the next crisis with the Ukraine. So, uh, and Added it's, on inside. Yeah, and it's not only about, um, it's, it's, it's a bit of what I like to call managerial attention to things. I mean, also mm. a government has uh, only limited resources to deal with uh, that many issues and that many crises. And for something that is already such a big thing, I mean, we're talking about a major, major transformation. And then you have a major crisis coming uh, sideways in then simply sometimes you don't have to do the, have to the capacity to deal with all this. And that is true for a company and for a government, for a country, uh, for a society as a whole too. Um, think about yourselves. I mean, you know, all of a sudden you're in front of your screen 12 hours a day. You might not have the time to think about certain things anymore. And it's the same for, you know, at every level here. So it certainly has derailed things a little, even though we were hoping that it was more like a good starter. But again, Ukraine, because of the specifics of the crisis, is then more of a push because of the urgency to think about energy specifically, right? So there is uh, something else happening. What it means geopolitically because of the two blocks is maybe a different question. It's, it's that might make it more, more difficult once again. Yes, much right. more difficult. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Thank been you a for wonderful being here. This one. I think I need to just like give a round of applause. And thank, thank you all. I would just yeah. like, I would, uh, uh, so we thank everybody for this session. It was a very interesting, very wonderful session which we had uh, on this idea of the sustainable uh, economic uh, development, the green transition, the challenges in this, the industries which are there. And uh, I thank uh, um, Daniel Taras for joining us for this particular session. It was wonderful to have you here and we look forward for more such kinds of uh, interesting um, lectures, interesting associations with you. 
uh, and with GIZ in, in terms of any of the activities such as uh, uh, internships, business incubation uh, projects, association of various uh, ideas, uh, sharing of knowledge in terms of academic industry knowledge which is there. So, we thank all the participants, we thank uh, uh, the uh, uh, we thank Daniel and we thank all the students for joining us for this particular program now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.